I didn't realize there would be a meditation moment before we got started. Okay, I've got the thumbs up and we're going to get going today. What a delight it is to be together, um, even in these challenging times, to look at uh, all of your Brady Bunch style faces feels wonderful. Um, my name is Jerry Colonna. I'm going to be uh, moderating somewhat this unruly group of teachers that we have here and holding space and trying to sort of weave together a bit of a narrative that may find us, uh, may, that we may find helpful uh, today. Uh, I'm joined by uh, two longtime teachers of mine and one brand new teacher of mine. Um, Sharon Salzberg and I uh, have spent many hours crying together, sitting together, growing together, and uh, she, uh, she is one of the most uh, important souls in my life. And it's an honor and pleasure to be with you today on the launch of your newest book, Real Change. Yay. Um, my other great good teacher is uh, my younger brother, Parker Palmer, um, with whom I have sat together and cried together. There's a theme here. We do a lot of crying together. Um, and there are a few people in life that I have learned from more than Parker Palmer. And then uh, this weekend, I had the glorious uh, experience of learning anew from Valerie Kaur and specifically reading her new book, her book, um, which was released this year, See No Stranger, which uh, blew me away and uh, moved me to tears. So there's that theme again. Uh, so thank you. Thank you all uh, for joining. And our format today is we're going to sort of uh, have a bit of a conversation. I've prepared some thoughts here, but I know that it's kind of like herding cats. So I'm going to let the cats go where they go. And then uh, at one point, we will start to open things up. And uh, uh, at least on my screen, there are 14 different screens of small little postage stamps. So I, we may or may not see your waving. So we're going to ask you to use the chat reaction and wave your hand if you've got questions. But we also recognize that some folks uh, are wired to be a little bit more shy um, and may prefer to have their questions come in from chat. And uh, for those questions, I've asked my good friend and dear colleague, Margaret Hendricks, to feel those questions and to surface those questions for us. Um, and so um, uh, that's kind of the format that we will go and we'll move from here uh, forward. So hopefully we'll have room for a good discussion at some of the themes that we'd like to talk to and then plenty of space for interaction, observation um, and, and questions as well. Sound good? How are, how are my co-hosts doing? We all good? All right. You all can unmute yourselves. Um, just don't eat any potato chips. So I thought I would start off um, by just making note of what I shared with uh, the co-hosts yesterday. And I wrote a quick little email yesterday. It's, it's not very long. And really to just to sort of set the context. And I wrote, having read or reread Real Change by Sharon, Healing the Heart of Democracy by Parker Palmer, and See No Stranger, I see a common call from each of you. Real, undeniably necessary change requires overcoming our own fears seeing the other as part of the whole, which also contains ourselves. Yes. And drawing upon our various faiths and elder and ancestral wisdom 
to see that just like me, the other more often than not is in pain. My sense is, and I think you'll all agree with this, that we can't really lean into this kind of a healing conversation without naming and speaking to the latest ways, just the latest ways in which that pain has manifested itself, be it in Minneapolis, Portland, Kenosha, or the Kentucky, or Parkland, or on and on and on and on. For me, it would feel tone deaf. For me, it would feel in, inappropriate to try to speak to this without also creating space <clears throat> for the variety of experiences that are out there. So I wanted to set that context and then sort of dive in with a first question. And I'll do this uh, actually by reading, um, attempting to read uh, from uh, Valerie, your book, See No Stranger. He wrote, I see no stranger, said Guru Nanak. I see no enemy. Guru Nanak taught that all of us could see the world in this way. There is a voice inside each of us called Tuhame. The I that names itself as separate from you. It resides in the bowl that holds our individual consciousness. But separateness is an illusion. When we quiet the chatter in our heads through music or meditation or recitation or song, the boundaries begin to disappear. The bowl breaks. For a moment, we taste the truth, sweet as nectar. We are part of one another. Joy rushes in. Long after the moment passes, we can choose to remember the truth of our interconnectedness, that we belong to one another. We can choose to see no stranger. Oh, that's when I cried. <laughs> oh, Jerry, that was only a few pages into the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's what you did to me. <laughs> um, so, Valerie, uh, later on in the book, you speak about uh, our wish for beloved community. And that if we want to have beloved community, we must become beloved community. Yes. Can you draw out the relationship between seeing no stranger and becoming beloved community? Yes. Nako beri nehi bagana. Nako beri nehi bagana. I see no enemy. I see no stranger. I was a little girl growing up on the farmlands of California when I first heard those words. I had come running home from school after hearing my first racial slur, black dog, in the schoolyard. And it was my grandfather who scooped me up and told me the stories of my faith. And Guru Nanak's story was always my favorite story. Here he was so distraught by the violence around him, the endless turmoil that he needed to retreat and disappear by a river for three days in order to drop in fully in a moment of revelation. And when he emerged, he had this vision of unity on his lips, ikkom God, oneness, I see no stranger. <laughs> My grandfather used to say, love is dangerous business. Love is dangerous business. So if I look upon your face, if I can look upon the face of anyone around me and say, you are a part of me I do not yet know. You are a part of me I do not yet know. Then I must be brave enough to let your grief into my heart and to stand up for you if you are in harm's way. So 
six became a warrior people. <laughs> Our ideal was the Sant Sepahi, the sage warrior or the warrior sage. The warrior fights, the sage loves. So I took it as a path of revolutionary love. And my grandfather, you know, he used to say like, you have to wonder about those even when they, if you refuse to wonder about you, you have to see even those who hurt you as a part of you and be brave enough to stand up for yourselves and all those they seek to hurt, but without ever losing sight that they are wounded. Don't abandon your post, he used to say, don't abandon your post. <laughs> and I was a little girl in two long braids who liked to ride tractors and look up at the stars, but I, I would nod my head. Yes, Papaji, I won't abandon my post. I think my entire life as a civil rights activist has been this struggle, this attempt to keep the promise I made to my grandfather to not abandon my post. And in the wake of, you know, all the assaults that we have survived under, under this presidency and long before, I mean, even just today with the president arriving in Kenosha, praising the young man who killed two protesters, um, likening the police officer who killed Jacob Blake to a golfer who choked on an easy putt. I mean, these are words that are just the latest words before coming on to join all of you that made me just want to turn away, give up. The fight is getting too hard. It's too hard to keep our posts. It's too hard to keep facing all of this when we have 180,000 people or more now killed by this virus, disproportionately people of color. When we have an election on the horizon, that's not just about that's not about left or right ideas, but about democracy versus authoritarianism. And it is difficult to be awake right now. It is difficult to be brave. It's difficult to keep our post. And this is precisely why I am so deeply grateful for Sharon's book. I'm so grateful to you, Sharon. You have been a teacher in my life for many, many years through your words, through your, through your books long before I got to meet you earlier this year. But this book, you're taking concepts of anger and grief and resilience and revolutionary love. What does it mean to be as brave as a warrior and keep the sight of a sage? How do we breathe through the contractions, the breathlessness that we are feeling as our, we are laboring to birth a nation that has not yet to be? I mean, this, the meditations that you have at the end of each chapter are a bomb to me. And I am so, I know this must be an impossible time to release a book into the world. And at the same time, I have felt like a book like this has never been more urgent. It feels like a handbook for all of us to not abandon our post in a time when the world most needs us to show up. Amen. Um, I was gonna turn to Sharon's book and, and do something similar, but um, I'm going to say, um, just respond as Sharon's student. Um, careful, I'm going to make you cry again. Um, a couple of months ago, when the world became so apparently difficult, because the truth is it's always been this difficult, especially for those, uh, those of us who are not in a white, privileged, cisgendered body. Sharon asked me, how do I keep going? And I said to her, you trained me for this. <laughs> for 16 years, Sharon has trained me. Yeah. She's trained so many people I know on this call right now. So from that place, for me taking my seat and holding my post, Sharon, I'd love to ask you to speak about what we learned from looking at a tree. <laughs> and this is from your book. Consider the different ways we can view a tree. We can see the tree as, distinctly de as a distinctly defined object, a single solitary, solitary entity standing there just by itself. We can also look at that tree and sense it as the manifestation of an extremely subtle net of relationships. The tree is affected by the rain that falls upon it and everything that affects the quality of that rain. 
it is affected by the wind that moves through and around it and the soil that nourishes it and sustains it. It is affected by the weather and by the sunlight and by the moonlight and by the quality of the air. We can look at the tree and see it as a network of influences and interactions converging. Similarly, we can look at this precise moment in our lives and see it just the same. Sharon, so many people ask you to explain this time and how to be in this time. How do I see someone who takes a weapon to someone with whom I politically disagree and see them as part of the same subtle network that draws us all together? First, I want to say I've never cried in a Zoom before. So, <laughs> starting with Valerie and now you, so uh, this is a first. Um, I think, of course, it's you know it's incredibly difficult, and and yet I I don't know that that's even the hardest part. I think I think the hardest part for me, for many, is understanding that. Uh, to see another as not a stranger, as part of this same network of, of connection, um, does not weaken us. You know, it doesn't make us sort of meek and sweet and, you know, overly sweet and saccharine and, and giving in. It doesn't mean you are not going to do everything in your power to try to seize that weapon or uh, stop some of the causes and conditions that have given rise to that kind of hatred. Um, we have to do that. And, and in some ways, I think being able to have that kind of vision, because it's the truth, you know, that's why it's powerful. It's not like this super imposition, like I'm going to have this spiritual overlay on some other totally disjunctive reality that is reality, that our lives are intertwined, that they're interconnected, that the constructs of self and other and us and them are constructs, and that really it is we. Um, that that doesn't disempower us because it's true. And, and we need to act from that understanding. You know, I was, I was listening to Valerie and I was thinking about um, the other morning when I woke up and in a rare space of complete discouragement, I thought maybe it's too late for America. Maybe it's just too late. You know, all of these issues are like embedded in the structure so deeply and like, maybe it's just too late. And it happened to be the day that I was recording one of the two segments of this series that are pre-recorded. Um, and that particular one was with people who had uh, been affected by the gun violence at Parkland. Um, there were, uh, if you look at the chat, there are four organizations that the proceeds from the series are going to. One is in memory of Nicholas Dwarrett, who was killed there. One is in memory of um, Jamie Gutenberg, who was killed there. And uh, Nicholas's mother and father and Jamie's father were on this panel, as well as some other people who were affected by that day. And uh, one of the things I said to Fred Gutenberg um, was that when we had our call prior to the panel, I mentioned to him, he has a book coming out called something like Look for the Helper, something like that. And I retweeted that book announcement. And that meant my name and his name were tied on Twitter. And so I got like the smallest glimpse of the hatred and the vitriol and the ignorance and uh, just sent his way. And I was like, whoa. You know, so I said to him, how do you handle it? And he said, I don't even look at it. Like, I don't look at the hatred. He said, the amount of love and compassion that has come my way is so extraordinary. I look for the helpers because they are real. You know, that is actually happening. And, and talking to him, talking to everybody on that panel actually inspired me so much that my discouragement just fled, you know, and, and that sense of hopelessness and helplessness, it just fled. And and, and that was the kind of um, connection to a bigger picture. 
you know, that I had really been longing for. And that's part of seeing that we are all tied in this garment, so to speak, to quote Martin Luther King Jr. Um, somebody's asking in the chat if it's possible to see the interview. That is day three of this series, so you will see it. Um, and it it reminds me that love is a power. It really is. I want to draw out one of the points you've made, uh, Sharon, which is um, really building upon this interconnectedness and, and seeing oneself as part of a greater whole. A movement is a word that comes to mind for me. Um, you know, I'll take a moment and pause and, and recognize another teacher of mine, Ani Pema Chodron, who during the spring when I was struggling, I turned to her book, Comfortable with Uncertainty, and a beautiful little passage in which she, she asks us to sit like a mountain in the midst of a hurricane while all around us, the weather is swirling and changing. And when she wrote the passage, she was really talking about our inner sense of turmoil, but it's just, it just so appropriate for now. And yet I struggled with what does it mean to sit rigidly in, like a mountain in a hurricane? Because to sit like a mountain feels like something capable of breaking. And when I realized that the mountain is twofold, it's our interconnectedness, it's our interbeing, and it's a sense of purpose, our connection to a larger whole, all of a sudden the capacity to sit, to hold our post, felt uh, possible. Even Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if I can get te teacherly for a moment, I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest rigidly. You know. Right. Because that is what breaks. That a mountain is uh, steadfast and dignified, and not rigid, and that's that's the point. You know. And uh, I love that what you just said about um, basically steering our lives. Because I remember another conversation with with this one dad from Parkland, Mitch. Or it, who whose son had been killed, and he has gotten very, very into mindfulness practice, which comes out in that in that panel. And um, in an earlier retreat we were doing together, he said, uh, "I know the pain will never go away, but I'm learning how to navigate it." And as soon as he said the word "navigate," I thought of the term North Star, and I thought that is what the greatest blessing is: is to have a North Star to have that set of values that we can steer by no matter what, and really no matter what. Um, and, you know, some people don't recognize that they can have that and others need to uh, see that, that it's there, that it's actually there and that we can have that sense of purpose and vision and uh, get through a lot that way. Well, I'd like to bring in Parker into this part of the conversation. Hello, young man. How are you? <laughs> Hello, older brother. This is a private little joke. He refuses to acknowledge age. Uh, you wrote something powerful in uh, a brilliant book, Healing the Heart of Democracy, which I had to turn to again this summer. You wrote, when all of our talk about politics is either technical or strategic, to say nothing of partisan and polarizing, we loosen or sever the human connections on which empathy, accountability, and democracy itself depends. If we cannot talk about the politics in the language of the heart, if we cannot be publicly heartbroken, for example, that the wealthiest nation on earth is unable to summon the political will to end childhood hunger at home, how can we create a politics worthy of the human spirit, one that has a chance to serve the common good? So, Parker, 
how do we create politics, a governance system that serves the common good, that recognizes the interconnectedness, the interbeingness, the subtle network that pulls us all together? How can we do that? Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Sharon and Valerie and everybody for being here. It just feels like a big family reunion. It's quite lovely. Um, so the book was inspired by a quote from Terry Tempest Williams, uh, which I just love, and I'm going to read it quickly. The human heart is the first home of democracy. It is where we embrace our questions. Can we be equitable? Can we be generous? Can we listen with our whole beings, not just our minds, and offer our attention rather than our opinions? And do we have enough resolve in our hearts to act courageously, relentlessly, without giving up ever, trusting our fellow citizens to join with us in our determined pursuit of a living democracy? The more I think about that quote, as I tried to do in the book, the more challenging it becomes to me. Um, I think the first important thing to recognize is that Terry Tempest Williams is using that word heart in its ancient sense, where it didn't just mean the seat of the emotions, but it meant the core, the, the center of ourselves, where all of our faculties, feeling, thinking, bodily knowledge, relational problem-solving knowledge converge, and we become whole people. That's the heart that she's invoking in that quote. And if, if, you, if you think about it, uh, it, it moves quickly beyond romanticism because, and I'm looping back here, Jerry, to your important question about how do you look at someone who has taken a gun and, and shot down his enemy, quote, and regard them as someone with whom you're in relationship. I think part of the answer, in addition to what has already been said, is that I have to recognize that I have in my own heart impulses toward everything that has ever happened in human history. That, that the heart is very a very complex organ, not just literally, but metaphorically. And I need to come to terms with that in, in myself, uh, with my shadow side, as well as my light, with my, with my repetitive errors, as well as my strengths and successes. This kind of self-examination is very demanding, and our educational system doesn't prepare us for it. I've often reflected upon, for example, my own education in the history of the Third Reich and the Holocaust. And I've realized that not once in that education, in, in a good, at a good college or at a good graduate school, was I challenged to think about the fact that the very suburban community that I grew up in outside of Chicago was, a, was in a part of the country where Jews were segregated into a gilded ghetto that was two suburbs up the lake from where I lived. I, I was never challenged to think about the fact that in my own growing up, the root dynamics of the Holocaust were present. Um, nor, more importantly, was I challenged to think about the fact that I have a little Hitler, a little fascist in my own heart. And by that, I mean that one of the features of fascism is that instead of engaging responsibly with the opposition, you kill them off. You, you sometimes do that with a gas chamber or a bullet, but in polite society, you kill them off with a slur, with a racist comment, with an oh, he or she is just a this or that, which renders them irrelevant to your life. And, and so, it, it, Terry Tempest Williams is, is right. It all begins with an examination of the heart. And then it moves outward into the kind of structures that we create because of what's going on in our hearts. I, I, I get impatient sometimes with people who say, uh, why are you talking about heart so much? It's all about structural this and structural that. Well, it is, 
But those structures are manifestations of a long history of the dynamics of the human heart. And then we structure into our systems all the stuff that we don't want to face up to in ourselves and maintain that as forms of unjust and oppressive power. So there's a dance to be done here, and it's a complicated dance, and it's for grown-ups. It, it has to be for grown-ups. And it, it depends a lot on how grown-ups are shaped in our society, through our schools, through our religious communities, through our civic organizations. You know, Jerry, when I, when I wrote Healing the Heart of, the, of Democracy, I, and I'll, I'll try to wrap this up, there's kind of a big topic that we're taking on, right? <laughs> Only, only this group deserves the biggest topics. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. So, uh, so I'll just, I'll just wrap it up with this. Uh, when I wrote Healing the Heart of Democracy, I was intent on looking at the democratic processes within the structures of the republic. Right. So we live in a representative democracy that's contained in a constitutional republic. And those structures were designed for certain reasons, including the fact that the, the framers realized that democracy can get out of control if it, if it simply means 51% of the people always get their way um, or less if you have an electoral college. I'd, I'd love to get the framers on this call. I'm sure they have Zoom wherever they are. <laughs> Zoom is everywhere and ask them if they would like a makeover in terms of certain elements of the constitution. Um, I'm sure they want a makeover, or I hope to God they want a makeover in terms of who they excluded from we the people. But just in terms of the simple structural question, I'll bet there are things that they would, would want to change because what's happening right now is not thoroughly envisioned. But what my real interest in, in healing the heart of democracy was to talk about the dynamics of democracy at its best, the, the, the way in which at every level we have to be engaged in self-examination, not only alone, but with each other in communities of discernment of many, many sorts. Again, educational system, religious communities, civic organizations. And we, we have to, examine our hearts at this deep level of all these human dynamics being there and becoming more conscious of them so that they so that we can control them rather than they control us which is which is probably why socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living um it, it's it's a it's a again it's a challenging and demanding dance but there are ways to talk about it. There are ways to do it that can take us to a much better place than where we are today. Um, again, so much more to say, but I guess I will say one more thing because I'm 81 and that's the point at which you start talking forever. <laughs> and you keep saying, I'm about to end, but then you don't. I just want to say one more thing. So. We have here the, some of the world's leaders on contemplation and meditation. And I count you among them, my friend. Um, I've that. learned so much from all of you. Uh, I've often said, and Sharon and I have discussed this humorously, that um, I've never been a contemplative by intention. I've always been a contemplative by catastrophe. Um, so it's when things fall apart that I, as in, as in clinical depression, for example, my three deep dives, which taught me a lot about my shadow side, if I hadn't done that learning, I wouldn't have survived them. And I see our, our nation at the same kind of point, uh, politically and soci socially. Um, so... Uh, by, by catastrophe, I mean that there's a, there's a way to understand con meditation and contemplation in which it turns out to be any way you have of penetrating illusion and touching reality. 
for some of us that it, that comes through spiritual discipline for me it comes more often from falling on my face from failing from collapsing from falling apart but I will close now by simply saying this, if there's any task that's urgent in our time, it's penetrating illusion and touching reality. Illusions with which we've mythologized our democracy to a very dangerous point of unreality and illusions in which we've mythologized ourselves to a very dangerous point of unreality. White people talking to white people about race is a critical agenda in our time. And that means acknowledging that I'm covered with white privilege and that I have my own inner forms of white supremacy, subtle as they may be. I don't burn crosses on anyone's lawn, but it's a cop out to reduce white supremacy to such a simplistic definition as that. And it, we must go much deeper 40% of us will never be able to do it, but the other 60% can, can win the day. Well, I, I will take facilitator's privilege by commenting on that uh, and then putting a question to the group and then expanding and opening up. And thank you for your kind words. You know, the, the, the phrase that I often use in my work as a coach and an author is this notion of radical self-inquiry. The maybe my most famous question of which was taught to me by my psychoanalyst, how have I been complicit in creating the conditions I say I don't want? Complicit, not responsible. I say I don't want these things. I think right now, that level of inquiry needs to happen on a society-wide basis. Because to your point, Parker, white people, and in particular white men of power and privilege, need to ask themselves the question, how have I been complicit? And how have I benefited from a div divisiveness in our society? And what do I need to give up that I value, say power, in order to see the change that I so desperately say I want to have? I don't know any other path through this time than being able to lean into these tough questions and lean into sharp points and perhaps turn the wounds that are existing so much right now into something sacred that takes us into that realm of beloved community where we are in fact just a subtle network connected together that would be my wish so boy howdy we went round the globe valerie can, yeah can i say something jerry yeah please as I'm hearing both you and Parker reflect on the role of white people in particular to engage in the self introspection and show up in ways that perhaps you haven't shown up before. I just have in my mind the image of a wall of white people standing in front of black people kneeling in the street in front of an army of police officers. The images that we saw this summer in the wake of George Floyd's murder and I thought, sure, this feels like 1968. It feels like 1992 for so many black people and brown people. And yet what's happening now to see so many white people stand by our side in the street, this we haven't seen before in our lifetime, that we are in a revolutionary moment in American history that might be the moment we can harness to transition our country to a truly anti-racist society, but it's about, it's about staying in the labor. And what I so appreciate and how you both approach this question is that it's not just a single outburst, it is a, a sustained and dedicated labor of self-inquiry and then showing up and then inquiry and then showing up. And I say this because I think that there's a, there's a chance 
for this generation of white people to change the meaning of whiteness in America, which has for too long been synonymous with either domination, complicity, or blindness. But what if this was a generation that changed the meaning of whiteness? So it's not even just allyship, but it's accomplices. What if you become accomplices to break these chains of oppression? And so I, um, I believe that this is an all hands on deck moment and that we all have different roles in the labor. And so I want to be really clear when, when I think we are calling for a love, a revolutionary love, or showing up in ways that we haven't before, that we all have different roles in the movement. If, if you are a person who has a knee on their neck right now, if you are a Black person or a non-Black person of color in America, if you have a knee on your neck right now, it's not necessarily your role to look up at your oppressor and try to wonder about them or listen to them or even try to love them. No, your job is to survive. Your job is to take the next breath. Your job is to love yourself enough to last. And that's the position where so many of us are in. But if you are a person by virtue of your white skin or whatever privilege you have, who is safe enough and brave enough to do that wondering, to do that tending, to see that even those opponents, whether literally or metaphorically, who are wielding violence against us, then maybe you can do the work of sitting with them. Because all of the aggression I see from white supremacist violence whenever I have sat with whites, I've sat with pe people who have murdered people in my community and whenever I've sat with them and listened beneath the slogans and the sound bites, I see their wound. There are no such thing as monsters in this world. They're only human beings who are wounded, who do what they do out of their own sense of insecurity or greed or blindness or whatever. And for so many disaffected white people right now, it's unresolved grief. They are grieving the illusion that this country ever belonged only to them in the first place. It may not be my job to sit with them and help them work through that grief, but it may be yours. You may be able to reach out to the relative or the neighbor or the, the person who is on your periphery and you can't face them, but maybe this, this is the moment. This is your, your role because the day after the election, no matter what outcome, all those disaffected white folks are still gonna be here. And within 25 years, our nation <laughs> will for the first time since colonization be a nation where the number of white people exceed the number of people of color. So we are at a crossroads. Will we continue to descend into a kind of civil war with those who want to return America to a past where only white, a certain class of white people hold power? Or will we, will we birth a nation that has never been on the face of this planet, a nation made up of other nations, a nation that is truly multiracial, multi-faith, multicultural, where, where we see no stranger. Those are the stakes. And it's, it's what we do between now and November. And then it's what we do and how we show up after November, because this is about generational work, generational transition. And I just want all those people who are woke for the first time now standing with us, understanding, proclaiming Black Lives Matter to stay in the labor with us, stay in the labor. When I see these books, both of them, I have them side by side, the Healing the Heart of Democracy and Real Change. I'm like, these are your handbooks. <laughs> this is what you use when you sit with yourself or you sit with your people to breathe and then to push and then to breathe again and then to push again because we need you to stay in the labor. Amen. Actually, Jerry, sure. if I could respond as well. Yeah, Yeah, I was just going to turn it to you. <laughs> yeah, um, I think uh, first with what Parker said, it is a, it's a delicate, delicate dance. And it takes everything we've got in terms of honesty and compassion for ourselves. When I was, I was in California in February, which I keep referring to because it was like this epic moment. It was like my last journey, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I don't know when the next one's coming. That's where I met Valerie. And, you know, like, like, and you gave me, you gave me real change at that I meeting. gave you real it change. Was just the right, the right thing I needed. I didn't know how much I was going to need it. And then we all locked down. So, oh. <laughs> and then uh, I was at some gathering and there was a, uh, you know, speaking and there was a psychologist there who said something like, um, the brain filled with shame cannot learn, Oof. you know? So how do we do that dance of, of honesty and confrontation and self-confrontation 
and not kind of spiral down into, in a way, shame is very, um, uh, it's a little bit like self preoccupied, you know, <laughs> as well. Uh, if what we really want is the learning. And so, and I, I think that's very hard to do alone. It's like one of the reasons that we need one another is to offer love, even in one's frailty or stupidity or whatever, so that that can be the mechanism to change because that's what we actually want. You know, it is not just um, decrying oneself and, and, and feeling like, oh, you know, there's nothing to be done. Uh, we desperately need change. And then in terms of what Valerie said, it reminded me of one of the interviews I did for the book because there were many, there are many people represented in the book um, who are working in, in the front lines of suffering in different ways. And uh, one was an environmental activist named Tim, Tim De Christopher, who'd gone to prison for a couple of years um, for an act of civil disobedience, which was uh, by, he was bidding on something like he was bidding on um, oil fields or something that he didn't have the money to pay for in order to preserve them from being sold. And because he didn't have the money to pay for them, he was put in prison for two years, which was sort of an outrage. But, um, and then when he left prison, he went to Harvard Divinity School. So I was very interested in him, you know, like, who are you? Uh, and then I got a chance to meet him and, and we had a very similar conversation to what Valerie was saying. You know, when you have been directly harmed or you are threatened, you're in danger, uh, your job is to survive. And Tim was suggesting what he called a compassion core, that the people who are not sort of directly in the line of fire, so to speak, that they be able to surround the person, not with weakness or pandering, you know, but with the strength of compassion, that it is not your job when your life is perilous, but maybe it's somebody's job you know, that there be love and compassion in this world because it will be a healing force. I'll say this. I think that as I age, part of what my job is, is to be an elder in this work. And I'm not 100% sure what that will be, but I know that this matters. Um, let's open it up. Um, and I know we've got a lot of activity going on with the chat. I, I, I tend not to pay attention to the chat because I, I try to focus in on the folks with whom I'm interacting. My brain can't process all of that. But um, we're happy to get the chat reaction, hands up, or take questions. Um, Margaret, maybe we'll turn to you and, and help, uh, help, help navigate some of this. Sure. This First question I think I'm going to send to Sharon. Um, a couple of folks in the chat are wondering about spiritual bypassing and how do you find the balance between sitting and action? Well, spiritual bypassing is always a possibility. You know, let's just admit that. Um, and, you know, I, I look both in myself and, and with others for words like transcend or uh, something that is somehow dismissive of feeling. Um, and even feelings like anger, you know, which it's easy in that sort of uh, hyper spiritual context to say is wrong or something like that. I think uh, every feeling deserves the dignity of its existence and that uh, we feel what we feel. That's actually one of my uh, slogans is we feel what we feel. Uh, another one of my slogans is some things just hurt, you know, and some friend just made me two cups that say something's just hurt, which made me very happy. Uh, because there, you know, there's sort of a going take in the spiritual world that if you had a different attitude, if you were just you know, thinking differently, uh, it wouldn't be grievous. It wouldn't be so terrible that whatever, uh, see your problem, your trauma, your hurt as a gift. Well, forget that, you know? Uh, this actually my, last book I can say now it's not really my last book the one before this real love um uh I quote uh Roshi Joan Halifax who said something like uh don't try to relate to the traumas of your life as a gift they're a given you know and once we get into that idea I've got to see this as a gift I've got to be grateful for this like miserable thing uh we're lost you know because we're just telling a story um 
but I think we can see that. And uh, I don't see action and meditation as antithetical at all. One of the other stories I tell in this book is about this time. Somebody asked me if I would offer a meta, meta, M-E-T-T-A, meaning loving kindness minute for the kids in cages at the border. And um, I was actually at an airport when they asked and I was like, I went home and I created a script and I did the audio. And then I was at another airport when the minute happened and, uh, but we did it. And, and I got a lot of complaints right away. Uh, not only complaints, but I got a lot of complaints on Twitter where you can tell I spent a good deal of my life. And, um, <laughs> you know, people were saying, you know, you're as bad as the people that just offer uh, thoughts and prayers. You know, why don't you do something? And why don't you donate money instead of just having people meditate? And this is so stupid. Why are you doing loving kindness? You know, you should be sitting in somewhere. And, uh, and I just kept responding saying, this is hard for me to look at. This is very hard for me to face. And to be going there with loving kindness helps me be there. It helps me actually be there directly. And I can't keep it up unless I can connect to something bigger. I can't. And so there's nothing wrong with that. And it's not gonna keep you from action. I would bet anything it will feed action in a much better way. If I, if I can add to that, um, I see the kind of breathing that you do, that you call us to do when you're leading meditations and mindfulness exercises, Sharon, as the kind of breathing that one does while in labor. And I'll say what I mean by that. Um, I'll explain what I mean by that. It was um, when this president took power, I had, you know, at that point, been an activist for more than 15 years. And white nationalists claimed his presidency as our great awakening, hate violence was skyrocketing. And I, I became an activist in the wake of a hate murder in my community. And with every film, with every lawsuit, I thought we were making the nation safer for the next generation. President takes power. I've just become a new mother. <laughs> and at this point, I'm looking at my son, who is, his first day of kindergarten was today. Remote, but you know. Um, I was looking at my son and I thought, oh, this little brown boy with long hair, wears his hair long as part of his faith, may wear his hair up in a turban when he grows up. He's, he's growing up in a nation more dangerous for him than it even was for me. And I felt like the breath was just taken out of me. And I had to find a way to breathe again. It was so painful, like it was visceral. You're talking about being attentive to the feeling in your body. It hurt, it hurt. And I realized like, oh, the last time I was in this much like pain and breathlessness was, was on the birthing table when I was birthing him. <laughs> there's, there's a stage in birthing labor that is a final stage. It's called transition. It's the most painful fiery stage in birthing labor. It feels like dying. Like it feels like dying. And yet it is a stage that precedes the birth of new life. So I began to ask the question that honestly was keeping me alive. And it's a question that I, I asked this morning, <laughs> looking at the news. What if this darkness in our country is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? What if our America is not dead, but a nation still waiting to be born? What if all of our ancestors who pushed through the fire before us are standing behind us now, whispering in our ear, you are brave, you are brave. What if this is our greatest tr transition? The midwife says to breathe and to push. She doesn't say breathe once and then push the rest of the way, <laughs> but she says, breathe my love and then push and then breathe again. I had spent 15 years just pushing, you know, and I was falling apart. I was breaking down and I took my first deep breath. I left the country after this president took power to start to, to write, to write this book, to write, you know, stranger. And it was, me finally learning that if I was going to last, if I was going to find longevity in the labor for justice, if I was gonna grow old like Parker, <laughs> who's come to take the place of my grandfather in my life, he just keeps believing in me, keeps giving me the wisdom I need, telling me not to abandon my post. If I'm going to be an elder one day, then I need to find a kind of pacing and rhythm, even when it feels like everything is on fire, it feels like dying. And that's, that's how, Sharon, your practices, which I knew about, I was like, oh, I, I need this kind of breathing in order to push. That's not spiritual bypassing. That's the kind of breathing that keeps you 
um, finding energy in the labor. And, and what I find is that when you breathe like that, when you breathe like that, the way that Sharon teaches us to be present to sensations in our body and, and sensations uh, and senses like of, of, the, of our immediate surroundings to drop in, to be fully present, oh, there's inevitably something beautiful around us or inside of us. There's my son, Radiant, who like came through the door right before we started, right? <laughs> Radiant, if I'm present, if I breathe like that, then joy rushes in. I can't force joy, but joy finds me. There's, there's a concept in the Sikh faith. There's no real concept of hope in the Sikh faith. It doesn't really translate well. The concept is called Jardvikala, which literally, literally means ever rising spirits, even in darkness, ever rising joy, even in the pain of labor. So I, I find that I can live my life in Chardikala. I can find joy in the labor if I'm breathing like Sharon teaches us to breathe and then pushing, showing up. And I've come to believe that, you know, the labor for justice will go on after I die. I, I've, come, I've accepted that my son and that my daughter will have to continue the fight. I've come to terms with that. <laughs> but if I can teach them what I have learned then it would be enough. And that's that laboring for justice with joy is the meaning of life. Uh, Jerry. Well, how, yeah, I Parker. Make, I would just make one small comment, including deep gratitude for these two teachers of mine. Um, and that is that there's, there's a kind of appeal to common sense that one can uh, <laughs> invoke when someone challenges the relation of contemplation or meditation to action. And that is to ask, well, the opposite of a meditative or contemplative state is frenzy. And what kind of right action has ever come out of frenzy? In, in fact, we are now watching a president use frenzy as, as a way of dividing our attention draining our energies. And a lot of people, center, progressive, and left, have fallen for that, consumed by anger, trying to address 32 things at once. And that's just in one day, because this president has dropped this bomblet and that bomblet. And so fr frenzy is no uh, state in which to mount right action or make clear discernments. Um, I took last month, August, offline, uh, largely offline, uh, because I was frazzled and I was ticked off and I was tired and I was getting depressed. And I, I didn't go anywhere. Um, my wife and I are in high risk categories, so we stayed home, but we live in a place where there are lakes and woods and I spent a lot of time out there and small nature, little nature, but lovely nature. And it just settled in on me as the month went on that this was my form of meditation and that my heart and mind were settling and that I was coming out of this with a much clearer sense of, as Valerie says, the next two months and what lies beyond, beyond that for me in my particular situation including, as Valerie knows, a, a very hard night where I remembered to breathe. <laughs> and, and, it, and it got me through. That's a weird thing to say that it took me 81 years to remember to breathe. But there you are. You heard it here first. Should have been Sharon's student many years before. Um, how about some more questions? Just jumping in here. Or, you sorry. Can raise yeah. your hand. If you click participants and at the bottom, there's a place to raise your hand and we can bring your question in via video. We can bring you live in via video or you can add it to the chat. I'm sorry. Thank David, you, sir. You have those two options. If you just click the raise hand button, we can see you and bring you in or you can include it in the chat. Let's give it a minute so people can raise hands. I see Jill. So let's see, Jill, you are live with us. Hi, um, I wanted to ask Sharon um, how to deal with the amount of anger that I 
I'm holding and carrying in my daily life. Um, I had a gun pulled on me organizing Black Lives Matter in my community. So I stopped that because I didn't want to be part of violence. Um, and I'm, you know, generally pissed off. And I've got a really messed up family I haven't spoken to for two years, but as everybody has different problems. Um, but the collective amount of crap going on just has me more angry than ever in my entire life at 59 years old. And I meditate every day, but I, I have this underlying anger I've not been able to work with. So if, if there's any advice for that, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think uh, we all may have something uh, we'd like to respond with, but uh, first of all, you know you're not alone. I mean, it's like uh, massive amounts of anger happening. And um, it's interesting. I, I think there's just a distinction between feeling anger, even intense, intense anger, and being swamped by the anger. You know, so our goal is not to wipe out the anger. It's to get a little space because in that space comes wisdom and comes possibility comes creativity so when I was working on this book on real change I had this thought you know what I want to use that Gandhi quote where he said something like um to be lost in anger and again that's different than feeling anger even intense anger that's being lost in anger to be lost in anger is like drinking poison thinking it's going to kill the other guy so I looked it up because I wanted to use it in the book so I had to source it and I didn't see it attributed to Gandhi at all I sort of attributed to Oprah Winfrey and the big book of AA and Carrie Fisher and the Buddha and all kinds of people, never Gandhi. And so I just put that in the book. I, said, I don't know who said this, you know, but that's the point. It's not because anger is bad or we're bad people for having it, even tremendous anger. It's because if we get lost in it, it will damage us. And this, um, you know, is, you've got a beautiful taco behind you, by the way, uh, of Chen Meizi, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. I, okay, yeah. yeah. I think the Bodhisattva of compassion, so that's perfect. Um, you know, uh, when we can feel the anger, then the positive part of it is energy. You know, in the Buddhist psychology, being lost in anger is like into a forest fire, which will burn up its own support, which means it will damage us. And like a forest fire, and speaking of California, you know, it will burn wild and maybe leave us at a place where we don't want to be, but we need that energy. That's what we need from it. You know, not to be complacent and not to be passive. And what I found, if I sit with anger um, and look at it, and that's sort of the mindfulness thing, you know, it's like we pivot from this going over the situation and the story and the existence of whatever to what does anger feel like? You know, we kind of turn our attention to the anger itself, feel it in our bodies, feel the, watch the movie of anger. We see a lot of sadness in there. Um, we, and I thought, you know, some of this conversation about white privilege is also about grieving. Um, you know, we see a lot of sadness in there. We see a lot of fear in there. And at the very heart, I've always found a sense of helplessness. And uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, they say that anger is what we pick up when we feel weak because we think it's going to make us strong. And it does have a strength in the energy and often a kind of courage, you know, like sometimes it's the angriest person in the room who's the only one is who's pointing to look at that flaw, you know, and everyone else is like studiously looking the other way. But it's also so damaging if we're lost in it, you know, because it will it will be so limiting of options. So when I found that place of helplessness in me, then I know what to do, which is one thing, one good thing, whatever it is, even if it seems meager, even if it seems stupid, even if it seems like it's not enough. Um, and that will actually begin the channeling of the energy in some way, which is really our goal. It's to take that energy and to channel it. And you can do that. But again, you know, some things are very hard to do alone and having a supportive community of some kind, which may not be your birth family, you know, it may be your chosen family, um, you know, will really help because we're all trying to work it through in some way. And, and it, it can be a very important thing. 
Any Thank other you. folks with uh, hands, just, just let us know as Soren had noted. And if we don't see any, um, Margaret, any other questions that are coming from the chat? Sure, and, and we can open this one up to all the teachers here. Um, maybe turning the discussion to resilience. Um, how do we find resilience in this work as we continue to do it? Finding the resilience to be laborious, but also finding rest. Sharon. Uh, yeah, well, the first thing that I would, I would love to hear from everybody else, I mean, uh, mm. the first thing that comes to my mind is I love the word rest, and we have to give ourselves permission to rest. Just like Valerie was talking about joy. Um, it's very, very hard when you are confronting suffering of some kind, especially such intense, palpable, and as Parker said, confusing times, you know, of like, what's going on? Um, to remember that we need the joy we need to have. I mean, that's in part what builds resilience is is allowing the joy, taking in the joy, because you feel so guilty. And that came up with almost everybody on that panel I did with the Parkland survivors. Um, and there was one young woman there uh, on the panel who I'd met the first time I went to Parkland, which was years ago and now, and uh, I did a, a workshop, a mindfulness workshop, and she said to me, um, you know, I feel, this was like a public question. She said, I feel really weird. And I brought this up again in the panel, which you'll hear in a couple of days. She said, I feel really weird because this is like an amazing experience. And I know the only reason I'm having it is because that horrible thing happened. And I don't know how to get over that and really appreciate this. And I said, I don't think we ever really get over it. We learn to hold both, right? And for many people, that doesn't feel okay. And even the mom, you know, whose son had uh, been killed, she said, I felt so guilty the first time I laughed again. And then I realized you've got to laugh. You've got to take that in, you know? And, and so giving yourself permission is going to be a very essential step. And the joy is there, you know, it, the joy is there in uh, the helpers, the joy is there in the loving kindness in the world, the joy is there in the forest, the joy is there in taking a breath. And, and that it will give us some rest and resilience. I, I also think, uh, friends, that um, in my case, when I look at what's behind my lack of resilience? What, why am I feeling defeated in the work I'm doing and the way I'm living? It's often because I've bought in unconsciously perhaps to some sort of cultural norm and that, that just is, is uh, set up for failure. And the norm that I have very much in mind right now is the very powerful norm in, in American culture that if your life and your work are not effective, successful in measurable ways, you're, you're not worth anything. And we have to acknowledge those of us who are in this struggle and who want to be in it for the long haul, we have to acknowledge the nonsense inherent in buying into that norm because the work we're doing is generational work. It always has been and it always will be. Um, it, it will not have results in my lifetime. Um, when I ask the question about any of my heroes uh, around values like love, truth, and justice, and I ask, were they able to die saying, I'm sure glad I devoted my life to that and made the sacrifices I made because now everyone in the world can check it off their to-do list, <laughs> love, truth, justice. It's quite clear that no one that I revere ever died that way. And I won't be able to die that way, but as long as I'm wedded to that norm of being effective, you know, I did, did I do enough of this? Did I do enough of this? Uh, then I'm, I'm going to regularly dip into despair and it's going to be hard to dig out. And, and, and in, in fact, I sometimes think that people who cling to that norm of effectiveness, or at least this is true when I'm doing it, 
are, are doing it as a sort of excuse to get out of doing anything because it gives you an excuse to throw up your hands and say, I, it's, it's over, it's done, this must not be my... Uh, the, the norm that I think needs to precede, supersede that one in the case of what we're talking about is faithfulness. Um, can I say at the end of the road, um, I didn't get it all done, nobody ever has, nobody ever will, but I was faithful to what I was called to do. And I don't mean anything high and mighty by the word faithful. I mean, was I faithful to my gifts? Was I faithful to attempting to see the needs of the world that are within my reach? And was I faithful to those points at which my gifts might intersect with those needs to the extent that's humanly possible? Always cutting myself slack for human limitations. Um, I, th I think in my case, that has increased resilience because every day I can ask, was I faithful today? How was I faithful today? How might I be a little more faithful tomorrow? And for me, those are human scale questions that are sustainable over time. I'll, I'll uh, jump in with a recommendation. Uh, I often turn to, uh, well, I often turn to poetry generally, but I often turn to, on this question, to the poem by John O'Donoghue um, in his book of blessings to bless the space between us for one who is exhausted. And among the pieces of advice he gives are to become inclined to watch the way of the rain, to steer clear of those vexed in spirit as if that's possible, and to be excessively gentle with oneself. And that's the one that I find the hardest and the most helpful. Because to build upon Parker's point, the driver behind effectiveness and outcome is sitting in this seat right here. <laughs> and that's one of the ways that I've internalized that sense of productivity and self-worth is to do more as opposed to hold that question of and thank you Parker for that have I been faithful have I been kind have I been true should we bring in there's a few people with their hands raised uh, let's see Crystal ah hi dear Let's see. Uh, I'm asking you to unmute. Do you see the option? You're good. All right. Um, I have a question. Hi, Jerry. Hi, <laughs> hey, Margaret. My sister. <laughs> um, I have a question for Valerie. Um, if you're still there, I saw you just disappeared. But um, are you still there, Valerie? Yes. I'm assuming and Valerie's you are. on mute. Okay, so there she is. <laughs> I'm here. Hi, so um, I was really glad that you mentioned your family and your children and the fact that you have a young son. And one of my questions in this particular moment, and I don't know how much thought you've given to this or if you've uh, written much about it or done much work around it, but for those of us who have uh, black and brown children, um, you know, I, I think, you know, as young folks really going through this particular moment for the first time, we ourselves are learning how to navigate it. And certainly, I think um, there'll be some gems in your book and Sharon's book as well. And, you know, there's a lot of focus on what we can do individually. But I'm wondering, I'm really curious about, um, you know, how we have conversations with our own children and what we can show them and model for them. Um, because, you know, I'm in my mid forties and I'm doing this for the first time. And I think that uh, it's difficult to teach our kids and what feels age appropriate for young folks who are also living through this moment. And I thought that maybe you could speak to this as a mother of young uh, brown children. So can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, my love. 
I just want to reach through the screen and hug you. Oh. I don't think there's any clear instruction manual for us. I think it's um, like summoning our bravery to do the best each day and listening deeply to wondering, you know, wondering about our child and how, the world that, that, is, that we've created around them and how much cruelty on the peripheries do we bring center stage to explain to them. I'm in the middle of this dilemma. My son at five, I mean, he heard his first racial slur at four. He was on the shoulders of my father coming home from a summer concert in the park. And my father heard a woman in an argument and tried to help. She was in an argument with a ferry conductor about crossing the Marino on a boat. And he ever, ever helpful trying to help. And the woman spun around, took one look at him and said, go back to the country you came from. And my father's hard of hearing. So my son had to tell my father what the woman had said. When we came home, I began to ask my son like where he felt, the, he felt the hurt in his body. Like what shape is it? What color is it? You know, let's, let me put my hand there. Let's, let me kiss it. Does it change? You know, at four years old, that was the, but he had no um, framework for the meaning of those words. He thought the woman wanted my parents to go back to their home instead of being in our home. <laughs> like that's what he thought. Um, I remember that night as, as I was putting my son to sleep, um, I thought he had fallen asleep and my mind just kept racing. I thought, how am I gonna keep him safe? How am I gonna explain it to him? How much is age appropriate? What do I do? And my heart was beating so fast. And I thought he was asleep when suddenly Covey like puts his ear to my mouth and says, mommy, I'm not hear you breathing. <laughs> you have to breathe to sleep, mommy. <laughs> and he says, breathe and push, mommy. Just breathe and push. <laughs> and I, you know, I, had, I had no idea my son knew what I did in the world, the words I said in the world, but clearly it had. And I thought, oh my God, my son has become my midwife. <laughs> you know, I think it's really easy for us to project a lot onto them and miss the kind of resilience that they are already building themselves by watching how we are resilient. And in our moments of collapse, they can do for us in ways that we do for them. They could be midwives to us in the ways that we are midwives to them. I'll share one more moment that we just had in the summer because in the wake of George Floyd's murder, I thought, I want my son to know that he's living through a historic moment, but at five and a half, and we've talked about cruelty in the past, but we haven't talked about cruelty in the present. And I hadn't yet sat and talked about the concept of race or, and, and yet our neighborhood in Venice for about a week after George's murder, his public lynching, became militarized. There was National Guard in the street in front of my son's preschool holding up the in front of the cafes where I wrote this book. I mean, it was, I couldn't even recognize it. Helicopters day and night, house shaking, sounds of popping grenades in the distance. We stayed in the house and I just said it was because of the pandemic and there's a lot of noise outside. And finally, when we got, we had to get in the car a week later and we were going down a street close to our neighborhood, in our neighborhood. And I was so worried my son was gonna see the men full decked out, the assault vehicles, the guns and ask me, cause like, how do I explain? And he looked out the window and he had this look of astonishment on his face. And I followed his eye line and I realized that my neighborhood had been transformed. The, all the shops had been boarded up and on those, those pieces of plywood, big public art projects, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Trayvon, Tamir, BLMs, hearts everywhere. And my son looked at me and he said, mommy, did you do this? <laughs> And I realized all he hears me talk about is revolutionary love at home. And I was like, no, Cubby, we did this. You know how the, the justice and the love that we talk about at home, there are millions of people rising up right now for love, for revolutionary love, because all of us are beloved and equal. And so I think that's it, my love. I think some, something in these stories about, about letting them take in what they can take in that is in their lived experience, right? 
And then always, you know, we, I think we talked about looking for the helpers, like always also turning their attention to how we are rising up so they don't feel alone or overwhelmed or helpless in the middle of it. That this is actually, an, as painful it is, as it is, a spectacular moment to be alive. Because you as a black mother, like so many black mothers have been alone and yet here I am as a brown woman by your side, fighting for your son, centering anti-black racism in my work in a way that I wouldn't even have done 10 years ago because I'm understanding that our liberation is not complete unless black lives are central to our anti-racism work. Right, that has never happened before. That's happened across, across movements and so many white people now standing up and saying, we're not just gonna be your allies, we're gonna be your accomplices. So turning our, we have the ability now in ways that our mothers and grandmothers didn't to turn our children's attention to all the acts of love, revolutionary love, solidarity that are appearing before us, showing them the newspaper, all those different faces flooding the streets. That's what I showed my son next with a black fist in the middle, right? Black Lives Matter on the streets in Washington DC, showing them, showing them that the world is changing, that they're a part of it. <laughs> but I just most of all keep breathing and pushing, breathing and pushing. <laughs> I'll take advantage and say, Crystal, give those girls of yours a big hug and a kiss from Jerry. <laughs> I think we may need to wrap now. Um, I know that we're at, we're almost at our time. Soren, can I ask uh, final words from Parker, Sharon, and perhaps Valerie? So uh, let's leave the final word to Sharon, but Parker, anything more to add or to? I think just a word of uh, deep gratitude for uh, the extraordinary privilege of being part of this community, of not only of conversation, but of mutual encouragement and uh, shared reflection and action. Um, it's Valerie talks about where she was 10 years ago. And um, where I was 10 years ago was not in denial about all of this, but having, you know, having begun my life uh, as a community organizer and um, working on racial justice in DC. But my understanding of these things from friendships like those we've been exploring here has grown so much deeper. And from challenges that are embedded in those friendships, um, you know, uh, Dostoevsky uh, ha has a great quote that Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker uh, Movement often cited, where he says, love in action is a fierce and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. And I've always resonated with that quote and with the mystery that's embedded in it. And what's fierce and dreadful about it, you know, is not the threat of violence. It's the threat of self-revelation. It's, it's the threat of being naked in your mind and heart and soul. And that's a threat that we all ought to walk into and welcome. And, um, I, you know, I won't get fully there uh, before I check out, but through communities of this sort and friendships of this sort, um, I think I'm moving in, in that direction and profoundly grateful for it. I, I guess my final word, Jerry, is I think two of the deepest human yearnings are to be at home in our own skins and at home on the face of a very diverse earth. And I keep feeling more and more and more at home in both regards. And I pray that blessing for everyone. Parker, in this moment, I just, I feel so much deep affection for you. Just fill my heart. 
I remember um, four years ago when you came into my life as really a mentor, an elder, a grandfather figure, not just through your books, but came into my life in that way. That was the first time you had told me, you know, I was like, we've we failed. I failed as if I could have prevented my alone. This presence, like what, what, um, I was a mess. I was a mess four years ago. And, and that's when you first told me measure your life, not based on your effectiveness. And as an activist, you're just caught, taught to look at the outcomes, right? You care about outcomes, care about outcomes, but measure your life, your, your, your life based on your faithfulness to the labor. And that just, has changed everything for me. So each day, the questions you ask yourself, how will I be faithful to the labor today, are the questions that I ask myself. And I have come, and I, I described this in, in, in See No Stranger, I've come to finally, you know, Audre Lorde says we can learn how to mother ourselves. I've come to finally summon the wise woman in me <laughs> to mother myself, to say, oh, my love, now is the time to breathe. And oh, my love, now is the time to push. And that keeps me faithful into the labor to have the wisdom to discern where I need to show up, what I need to do, show up for myself, for others at any given moment. And I just, my wise woman in me is calling me to this group of people to say, oh, my loves, <laughs> we are entering a massive push. In the days that are left leading up to the election, whether we push, whether each of us shows up with our very best to get as many people to the polls as possible, that will determine not just the future of the next four years in our country, but the future of democracy in this country and therefore the future of really humanity when we have climate change on the horizon. So much is at stake. What happens in this election matters for your children, for your grandchildren, for mine. So what can you do to push in ways that you never have before? Can you volunteer? Can you phone bank? Can you become a poll observer? Can you, can you become a poll worker? In what ways can you commit to asking three people in your life? It's called vote tripling. Can you ask three people in your life in swing states to vote? And can you guide them to overcome their own cynicism and keep that promise to you? That kind of, in each of us individually, all critical mass of us doing that, that's the push. That's the collective push we so badly need. And I'll leave you with this story because I still hold in my heart Sharon's call to joy. The last election night, <laughs> as the results were coming in and the horror started to set in my body, my son, who was about I think, two at that time, tugged at my sleeve and said, mommy, dance time? Because <laughs> I had made this rule that we were supposed to dance every single night, no matter what. And my, my husband looks at me because I was like, not on a night like this. It's the last thing I want to do. And my husband looks at me and says, your rules? Because <laughs> I like to lay down the rules. So we turn down CNN and we turn up the music. And it's, you know, at the beginning, I'm just like a zombie. I just am so miserable. I'm not connected to my body. I'm not at home in my skin or at home in the world, right? I am elsewhere. I'm jettisoned. I'm dead. And suddenly my son, it's baby, you're a fire work. And he jumps in my arms and he says, he says, throw me mommy. Um, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Just like the moon, moon, moon. I'm throwing him in the air and he's laughing and suddenly I'm laughing and he's dancing. Suddenly I'm dancing and I'm dancing. Our family is dancing on election night. <laughs> Afterwards, I felt this like rising energy in me and I thought, Oh, this is Jardikala. This is ever, this is the ever rising joy, right? Even in such darkness. And I sat down to pen my first declaration that we were going to fight with love, that we were going to show up. And I have come to believe every night since then, we do dance time every night because joy returns us to everything that is good and beautiful and worth fighting for. Joy is our fiercest act of world resistance. So even as we make this push in the next 50 some days, how are you protecting your joy every single day? That will keep us going. Thank you. Sharon, mm -hmm. you can close Gosh, this I, out. I just agree, of course, with everything Parker said and everything Valerie said and everything you say and everything mm -hmm. Crystal said and 
uh, I'm just feeling like incredibly connected and, and so happy and grateful. Somebody had put a question in the chat. If I had one thing to recommend that people do, would it be meditate, vote? What would it be? So I'm just going to echo Valerie and say, vote, 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 vote. Uh, and uh, Soren knows this, that we've had this conversation as well, that I, I feel like um, the act of voting is really uh, something that is so resonant with the Buddha's view of the innate dignity of everybody, that everybody has worth, everybody should be able to express it. And this is just a time where it's really essential. And it, it's probably just the beginning of acts of engagement, but it's the pressing one right now. So you can meditate too. I think that's a good idea. It's the way we keep going. And dance. And dance. And dance. Every night. <laughs> and um, the, Quaker, the Quaker contribution is oatmeal for breakfast every day. <laughs> <laughs> Eaten in silence, right? <laughs> um, I just want to say that uh, I, I feel badly that we didn't get all of the questions and all of the energy uh, that was coming in. Please know that you were seen, even if we could not hear. And uh, I, I just want to close with just one taste that perhaps this is just a taste. These kinds of conversations are the taste of what beloved community could be. And I think that's how we move towards healing. I don't know that we are ever healed as much as we are moving towards healing. Um, Sharon, Parker, Valerie, thank you for the honor and privilege of holding space with you. Soren, Haley, thank you, thank you, thank you for recreating Wisdom 2.0 in a Brady Bunch-like fashion. Um, thank you all for being with us today. Um, what an honor and privilege it was to be with you. So thank, thank you. you for Maybe thank you. we can just let people unmute themselves and we can say some goodbyes and you can go to the gallery view and you can wish Sharon well or wish anyone well. So you can unmute yourself now. Thank you. 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 Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks. Sharon. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Gracias. Thank you. Bye. 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 That's yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, well, next you. time, three hundred people coming on, honey. That's <laughs> yes. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good.